nothing to it but to do it. Nothing to it but to do it here, guys. All right, we're back. Back doing a little financial modeling. This is gonna be an interesting one here, guys. Um, today, we are doing Liberty Media Formula One. Uh, probably the most complicated, well, was the most complicated Liberty Media Company. Uh, as you guys know, we've done um, Liberty Media Companies like um, Liberty Sirius XM in the past. So, um, so um, a little bit familiar now with the complexities that are involved. You guys may find uh, you know, the same earnings kind of uh, reporting styles. But um, a little thing that we probably need to get into is, um, as this is the first time we've ever done this company, get into a little bit about um, the sport, how this company derives its revenue and stuff like that. Um, also, for those of you interested, there is, as of the recording of this video, the uh, Belgian Grand Prix is this Sunday. I, of course, am rocking my McLaren jersey, Team McLaren, uh, for the video. Um, the team I support. So, um, for those of you that don't know, Formula One is a uh, is an automotive sport, much like NASCAR here in the United States. Um, what they particularly do is um, all these different companies build their own cars, go head to head. Companies like Ferrari, Mercedes, McLaren, um, all have these huge teams and they build uh, Formula One cars and um, race them against each other to go and find uh, who has the, uh, the best car. And they race all around the world. Um, this year they were supposed to do 22 Grand Prix. Uh, they're only doing 17, but the fact that they could even get um, that number in so far is spectacular. Um, so, going on for a little bit more, I can go and explain now that you guys got a little bit of uh, understanding about, you know, it's motor racing sport. Um, how Formula One goes and drives its revenue, I've got my rev build up here. And um, Formula One, um, Liberty Media Formula One, Formula One itself as a company, they own the uh, broadcasting rights. They are not doing the, uh, thanks for joining Money Boss, they are not doing the Monaco Grand Prix this year. That's a good question, um, unfortunately. Uh, you guys can find the complete uh, lineup of their races on Formula1.com. Um, so how Formula One, the company works, is um, they own the broadcasting rights, the rights to be able to hold a race, and um, any type of sponsorship rights. So, yeah, dude, it's, it's a big one. The U.S. actually has a Grand Prix. We're about to get another one. We have the one in Austin, the American Grand Prix. Then we're going to go and get one that's down in Miami. Unfortunately, because of COVID, all that changed things around. Um, so, how Formula One goes and makes money is uh, they, can, uh, they have this type of uh, revenue called race promotion, which means they get money from... Uh, the races themselves. So what will typically happen is a municipality like my boss was talking about, um, Monaco, will go and uh, say we want to host a race and once them and uh, them and uh, Formula One come to an agreement they pay a certain amount. Normally it's um, for a European race. It starts up at about 25 million dollars per year and has a 5% escalator going up so that uh, contract uh, increases by 5% a year. If it's in a what they call a flyover race, which is anywhere kind of outside of Europe. It's $30 million and continues to scale upwards. So depending on the length of those um, contracts, it can go out. Um, for instance, um, Goodwood Go and Show is the Canadian Grand Prix. Their contract length is I think until 2035. I think they just renewed that. So um, you can go and imagine, you know, it's a lot of built-in revenue growing at 5%. So that's how they go and make money there is they, um, various uh, countries or municipalities or racetracks like um, the racetrack for the British Grand Prix is Silverstone they've hosted it for I think the, they just had their 70 their 70th Grand Prix there um, so you can go and see these contracts you can build and you get a uh, built-in revenue graph essentially uh, the average step up being about four percent the other way Formula One gets revenue is broadcasting so um, any type of uh, distributor such as Sky such as ESPN will go and pay to go and broadcast this, will go and uh, pay for the right to go and broadcast the sport. 
that typically um, has a 3% escalator built in. So, um, and to go and just show you how many, company, uh, how many companies and countries across the world, um, we've got about, I mean, this is just separated by country. And then free to air, and as well as their uh, Formula One's uh, streaming service. We go from Albania all the way down to the US. So they're a worldwide sport, which is kind of insane considering how little um, people in America care about it. And then finally, advertising revenue. So of course, um, you get to go and pay to go and have your brand represented at the Grand Prix, um, whether it's uh, kind of corner advertising, like uh, they're going into a corner and they go and see a nice plaque with your logo, or um, Brands like Heineken, Johnny Walker, and several other brands will go and uh, pay to go and have it be their Grand Prix. Like, um, if I recall correctly, the China Grand Prix, which isn't happening this year, unfortunately, is almost always the um, China Grand Prix brought to you by Heineken. So that's that's another big one because, um, on average, for some of these attendances, um, if I pull up the last one, they're they're huge. Um, we can see here, I don't have the 2019 data in, but um, a total of 4.2 million people went to races last year in 2019. For 2018, you can go and see like uh, the Australian Grand Prix had almost 300,000 in attendance. Um, the British had 340,000, and a couple of these other races down here have pretty much quarter of a million to Mexico being at about 350,000, so a lot of race attendance. So these are big time events. Uh, it's kind of like the Super Bowl, but it happens every kind of couple weeks. Um, so it's a really, really interesting sport, and it's it's um, interesting that we can go and buy it as it's kind of the only publicly available racing company to go and buy in kind of sport like that, other than Manchester United over in England that you can go and buy uh, publicly, and the other one that I'm aware of, other than WWE as a sport, is Liberty Media's holdings of the Braves here in the U.S. for baseball. So now that we've kind of gone into kind of how the revenue and all that stuff like that works, we'll actually get into the earnings. And this is going to be a weird one to do because as I discussed in our model for SiriusXM, this was one year where um, Formula One and SiriusXM's kind of bodies kind of switched some assets around. It used to be that uh, Formula One had the Live Nation stake, which obviously now Liberty Media SiriusXM has. They also had uh, a lot more holdings of both Liberty SiriusXM and Liberty Braves. So um, a lot of their debt got swapped off for exchange for the Live Nation stake. So there's gonna be a lot of balance sheet stuff that we gotta go and do. So the NAV, um, it's actually gonna be uh, very interesting because the NAV method may just be a mute point because beforehand you could go and do just an, a Formula One DCF like, like I have here, um, where we could just take the cash flows because that's the only way that Formula One gets revenue is through the Formula One business, but then you tacked on all those other assets. So then I did another DCF going and essentially adding on all the other parts to the EV and then also did a, an AV method. So I liked it back then because it was really cool to go and see what Formula One was worth and then you can tack on the other assets. So when uh, when I was trading at like uh, this past year at these distress prices of $20 a share, I think it was the low. Um, let's hop on over to oh, that's, that's not what I wanted entirely. Let's hop over on to Adam Finance. Let's look at a chart. So yeah, lows were, you know, low 20s uh, over there in March, and uh, now we're up to 40. And luckily, uh, this is a holding of mine as of this recording. Um, I was able to scoop them up because I knew what the true value of Formula One would be, even if I went and uh, said, okay, half the races will be available this year to a fourth of them, and was able to scoop up shares at a pretty decent price. Um, speaking of which, I might as well go and just update this real quick. Because it closed out exactly $40 a share. That's pretty crazy. All right. Let's go into... Let's go into filling out the model itself. So primary revenue is all the revenue that they normally get from... Um, races and such. Uh, unfortunately, this quarter there were no races. 
and their primary revenue was zero, but their other revenue was 24. Team payments, um, for this, Actually, I was mistaken there. Um, for team payments, what that is is um, half of whatever Formula One makes goes back to the teams in order um, to keep them involved in it. Also, there's prize money with who gets what spot on in the Grand Prix and stuff like that. So, um, because there are no races, that's going to be a zero. Other cost of 16. And then SGNA, but this always changes for some reason based off of this earnings sheet and the actual 10K. So we'll double check the 10K after this. Stock base comp. And appreciation and amortization. Where this is also me having to remember too on my model setup because I haven't touched this one in forever. Yep, there we go. So, all this I'm gonna have to go to a different sheet for. As you can see, uh, last year during the same kind of second quarter, there would have been seven races, there have been none so far, but um. The way it's gonna pan out this year is Q3 is gonna be pretty much where all the races have occurred. There's been about 10 races so far, uh, eight to 10 if I remember correctly. And they're pretty much all gonna fall in Q3 and some others onto Q4. Um, the big thing that I wanna go and look at is because of the balance sheet rearrangements is the little nice little thing that Liberty Media does over here. They tell us by each group what the debt load is. So those are now zero. That stayed the same. That got a write down of only one dollar. That's zero. Live Formula One bank loans, which is actually the Live Nation margin loan. That's zero. Oh, actually, no, that's the term loan. Corporate and other. And they were running, I remember I put this in for the conference call, they were running at about six times leverage. So. This is also one of the other ones that I really need to go and do with some of these adjustments that they have on here. Like the intergroup interest. Just one of those things with these companies that just really kind of sucks to do, but. Yeah, I can see the hole right there. The other public holdings. So that also means we're gonna have to strike pretty much all of the Live Nation holdings from Formula One, so it's probably gonna be valued a lot less than it currently is. Um, then after, so that's pretty much all I needed there. We'll go over to their 10Q. This is where I get to go and do all those fun little other costs. SGNA normally changes. Yeah, see on this one it's 40. DNA. Yeah, that all checks out despite uh, 
Only difference is uh, stock-based comp, interest expense. They did. They they had to go and uh, sell off the Live Nation stake. Really go and really bolster the balance sheet. Oh no! I might have to work my way up. Oh, because of all the swapations, I gotta add so many new lines. Oh wait, no. I just haven't had interest income in a while. Share of earnings. Realized and unrealized. Cool, cool, cool. That sweet delta is still just our income tax. Oh, finding the shares outstanding for Formula One is always a pain in the ass. So I'll just go straight for the balance sheet. We can go and see here, but huge change in cash cash equivalents based off of that uh, shift in uh, formula in uh, the Live Nation stake. the pp and &E method over down here. makes a Liberty Media Company fun, is doing all of this work in the balance sheet. Really the, the irresponsible thing to do, but one of the things that I would just rather do for these is just not even do a model for them, other than like in some rare times, like um, this year with the huge drop that they had, does it actually work to have a model for them? better just to close your eyes almost and uh, know that you're betting on it on some type of financial kind of play with a great business in there I'm not sure what I'm missing here. So my current assets is dead on.
I really don't know what's the problem here. That's so weird. I guess I'm just gonna leave it like that for right now. I'll probably go back and change it so that it all works out. Cash flows, I hate doing monthly cash flow statements. I mean quarterly cash flow statements, so. Very nice, very nice. Now to find shares outstanding. It's tough because they always. We gotta really clean up first off of these. Cause that's now gone. That's been attributed. go. Get some major dilution here. New price target at about 
even worse when we just do Fonk DCF only a little bit lower but for these it does account for the older debt expense not the new one um, the, the older debt not the new debt so and AV is the most current one however I think on the revenue build yeah I did 16 it's currently at 17 races so I feel pretty good about that um, Although we do have significantly lower prices than what it's currently valued at. Um, so that makes it a little bit interesting here. Um, I don't have any real charts that I update for this guy. Um, this is always one that perplexes me because it's... Um, what you're really buying is even on a fluke year like this, they have such a long... Um, they have such long commitments. And even if I go and I adjusted this for what the current races are, right? I have to go and recalculate this, but um, the rest of these are pretty much going off of an escalator at the moment and not the true calculation down here. Like, uh, cause that would be almost a, you know, that would be a huge spike in revenue. So, I mean, I kind of did this to be conservative. Cause if instead, for these guys, I entered in those what you get is a price targets much closer to our current um, to the current price but um, I'm being ultra conservative and I did that during um, their Q1 earnings call and um, a little bit before Q2 just in case there weren't as many races as we thought that there were going to be because it was still kind of up in the air about okay they're going to do like seven races, what's it going to turn into, and um, now it's 17, so um, I still have 16 in there just in case they um, one gets cancelled or whatnot, but uh, they're close to almost being what their full season would have been, which would have been 22, I mean they're five races, uh, I mean, well not five, uh, six races short, but still, um, compared to a lot of the other big sports out there, they, they're the closest to having a complete total um, season than uh, any others. So, um, yeah, it's definitely one to keep an eye on. It's great because you can uh, watch the sport, you can uh, you can understand the economics of the sport and all that stuff like that. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. This one was a kind of a, a, a more blend of kind of what about the company and stuff like that than uh, straight just updating the model. Um, as always, guys, I'm going to start. I, I shifted doing these streams on Mondays and Wednesdays to only Wednesdays just um, for more flexibility in the future. Um, as always guys, hopefully you guys enjoy these. You can follow, you can join in live every single Wednesday um, for these financial modeling um, and earnings update model streams. Uh, and join me on Fridays and Saturdays for Q&A, doing zombies, um, even some more zone every once in a while and uh, today was announced that the new Call of Duty is going to be coming out. So that should be exciting and we'll swap to that once uh, that gets on and uh, yeah, it's going to be a fun time. Uh, I hope to see you guys uh, next time.